welcome to the ADHD Women's Wellbeing Podcast. I'm Kate Moore Youssef, and I'm a wellbeing and lifestyle coach, EFT practitioner, mum to four kids, and passionate about helping more women to understand and accept their amazing ADHD brains. After speaking to many women just like me, and probably you, I know there is a need for more health and lifestyle support for women newly diagnosed with ADHD. In these conversations, you'll learn from insightful guests, hear new findings and discover powerful perspectives and lifestyle tools to enable you to live your most fulfilled, calm and purposeful life wherever you are on your ADHD journey. Here's today's episode. Today, we're talking about something that normally fills me with dread, but I have to say I'm super excited. Um, I've got Rachel Harris here and Rachel Harris is, wait for it, an accountant. I know I've not gone mad. I promise you this conversation is going to be incredibly worthwhile. Now, Rachel is disrupting what it means to be an accountant, a business owner and an employee in 2023. She's a TEDx speaker. She's a content creator. She's brilliant on Instagram, author, business owner, and most importantly, she is an accountant. Um, And she adds value to her audience of 30,000 by creating completely free, long and short form content delivering financial education. And she is passionate about free financial education for everyone and is the founder of Accountant She and Strivex. Now, I am so excited to speak to Rachel because even though she's not ADHD herself, she prides herself in having a huge neurodivergent community and helps lots of neurodivergent business owners and entrepreneurs. And that is what we're going to be talking about today. So Rachel, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. That was a a solid intro. I've also had a really great couple of months on social media and my community is now 75,000, not 30,000. So we have had a great time. (laughs) Fantastic. And that is because you are sharing long and short form education about accountancy, finances. I've been on your Instagram and I have to say it's not dry. It's not boring. It brings what you do to life and how you can help people. And I know there's so many people who maybe are desperate to run their own business. They've entrepreneurs, there's this budding desire to have this autonomy and work for themselves and they've got ideas. And then all of a sudden the block comes, the fear, the self-sabotage, the the limiting beliefs of, I can't do accounts and I don't know how to use an Excel spreadsheet and maths isn't my thing and I can't understand money and all these things that I often hear when it comes to certain types of ADHD brains. And I just wondered why you think what you do is so kind of aligned with the neurodivergent brain. If I had to put it into one sentence, I think really, I do a very serious job. I own a a million pound accountancy practice with 20 members of staff and 800 clients, but I don't take myself too seriously. And I think when you are neurodivergent, you've had to look so much at yourself to understand what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are actually to be able to speak about your weaknesses, which for a lot of people is finance, whether that is interpreting it, understanding it, or tackling the anxiety around the finances. You have to have somebody that feels approachable, someone that you can talk to about this stuff without feeling like it's a limit, and actually how you can lean into that to make it your superpower. Yeah. You just told me before that you are actually profoundly deaf, and you understand how important it is to have people's communication needs met. And so for someone that has built so much, like what an incredibly successful business, um, knowing that you have this, you know, what other people would perceive as a limitation and you've managed to overcome this and create something so incredible. What do you mean by communication needs and how what do you do differently? Like, how are you able, like, what are you doing that so many other accountancy should be doing? (laughs) I think a really big part of it as well, which I like to talk about when we're talking about my hearing, is that I've been able to scale a business as well without making that my entire brand. I think very often we're almost like encouraged to repeatedly talk about it and make sure everybody knows. Whereas for me, my comfort zone is being quite private about it and doing it in spite of it not because of it and knowing that my business is successful because of me, not me plus constantly talking about a disability or some form of communication preference. And so for me, 
not really leaning into that and understanding who I am outside of that as well as inside of it has been a really important piece for me as a business owner. It's definitely created a safe place. And I see lots of neurodivergent people do that as well, whether that is autism, ADHD, dyslexia. I've seen so many clients almost go through the diagnosis process of either dyslexia or dyscalculia through conversations, financial conversations that we've had together. And so our sort of neurodivergent practice journey stemmed from my communication preferences. So as somebody who owns a business that has scaled from my dining room table to a million pounds in three years, I have had to rapidly scale myself as well as rapidly scaling my business. And one of the difficulties that I was constantly encountering because of my communication preferences was the perfect example is trying to find a telephone provider while scaling a practice that wants to offer hybrid working opportunities for my employees. So we come into the office one day a week, but we're at home outside of that. I wanted to find a telephone system that was basically VoIP, so voice over internet. And I could not find a telephone provider that would not speak to me on the telephone. And I know that sounds mad because they're a telephone provider, but they must have encountered this before. HMRC. I can do text relay with HMRC, but I can't do it with a telephone provider. Like this is wild. How how is this the case? And so I guess through my own journey of trying desperately to spend money (laughs) with the suppliers, but actually not be able to do that and to have pretty wild responses from people of the decision maker in your business needs to be able to communicate in this way. Otherwise we can't engage with them or actually just asking to speak to somebody else who isn't the decision maker just Mm. because they don't have the communication preferences that I do. And so the first step towards, you know, lowering the barriers to entry and making what we do more accessible to people that have communication needs, whatever they are, was to actually, whenever we take on a client, we ask them three very simple questions. The first is, what is your 10 out of 10? And that is, what do we need to do in order to sit here in 12 months time and for you to score us a 10 out of 10 as your accountants? So that's the first question. First question is, what's your 10 out of 10? The second question is, what are your communication preferences? Some people have anxiety around answering the phone. You don't actually have to be neurodivergent to have that anxiety. Lots of us do. Some people's inbox are a hot mess and they preferred to receive calls. And so what that does for you as a client is put you in a safe comfort zone where you know we will only ever contact you in a way that you have consented to and that is your preferred method. But it also does huge things for my team. As somebody who trained in a very traditional practice, I was maybe taught to write to people who never check their post or call people who fundamentally don't want to be called. And so what I'm able to do for my employees is make sure that they are only contacting people in a way that they want to be communicated with. Also with instructions on their 10 out of 10 is over explain, double check before you hang up the phone that they have understood what you've said, Mm. give them an opportunity to ask silly questions and encourage them that no question is a silly question. All of the way through to other people in their 10 out of 10 say, Every time you speak to me, please can you make sure that I'm not spending all of my money on online coaches? And every single time we ask that question. And so it makes the team feel really comfortable. They're communicating in line with their needs and they've got instructions on how to keep them happy. And the client is always happy because we're following the instructions and we're communicating with them. And then the third question is just, are there any specific adjustments that we need to make because of any disability or preference? So for me, in bright red, that would say, do not call this person. They are profoundly deaf. Um, For other people, it could be, this client is pregnant. Please don't call them. Like, please try and do as much as possible without contact to the client because they are on maternity leave. And so those three very simple questions have hugely dropped the barriers to entry for people accessing financial education because so much of what we do is digital. It's online. It's on demand. And so we actually have other than doing proof of ID checks, which we have to do, you can actually access our content, our service completely on demand, but still receive a very, very high level of service to the other end of the spectrum to people who can't engage with on-demand content. 
because of neurodivergence mm. actually can do they can book body doubling calls they can book walk and talks lots of people build up lots of fear and anxiety in their chest about finances and so mm. you can book a walk and talk which is where you and your accountant walk and talk at the same time to get the heebie-jeebies out of your body build a person-to-person connection and we can take everything back and worry about that while we're at our desk and so yeah, yeah that was the start of the journey for me fantastic you know it's so refreshing to hear isn't it because you are personalizing this and you're like you say you're breaking down those barriers of, of fear and very often when it comes to checking our bank accounts understanding taxes invoicing all of this just so much fear and we don't want to open the bills and we don't want to read the statements and we we don't want to do that because intrinsically we are probably ashamed, embarrassed. Um, there's, you know, an old childhood sort of trauma there. I really believe there's a huge amount of trauma um, in not understanding maths and then feeling stupid, even though we can set up businesses and we can do all this amazing stuff, but we have like a core belief that we're stupid if we don't understand how to um, how to calculate our profits or something like that. And that was one of my massive core beliefs. And it was only yes last night, um, um, obviously because it's sort of end of tax season coming up here we're recording this at the very end of January and I was just going through my statements with my husband um, and thankfully I've got a really amazing accountant and this has only just happened this year he's young he's dynamic I told him straight off about my ADHD and I told him all I basically just kind of um, gave him the full over explaining of of how I kind of see maths and accountancy and he's actually been amazing and he's he's done that thing where at the end of the call he said um do you want me to explain anything is there anything that's unclear um is there anything else I can help you with would you like to go through something else again and he's really made me feel comfortable that I can say I'm really sorry I know this is a stupid question but and I've never, ever had that before. I've never been able to admit to another grown human adult that isn't my husband. Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand something. And at the end, he said to me, he went, you've had a really good year. Well done. Like, well done. And that validation from someone who gets maths, um, where for me, it's still, I feel like I'm sort of on like level one. Like I'm just about getting there and understanding it has been massive for my own self-esteem. And what you're explaining, you know, there's so many, I think this new generation, this new era of people who want to work um, in different ways, who aren't accepting this old school mentality of, you know, in the office nine to five um, and, and maybe who are wanting to set up their own businesses or working freelance or having different ways of working, you know, again, you know, when I, I went through with my accountant, all the different ways I work and it's the podcast and it's coaching and it's on, de- on demand workshops and it's different income streams and he just got it and so I think what I'm trying to say is I hope that this is like a new era of demystifying and no longer being afraid and actually empowering people that if they do want to set up their own businesses the accounts and the maths and the taxes doesn't have to be that barrier to fulfilling our dream and especially with this audience that I know who are listening are there's so many that just say I don't want to work for a corporate anymore I don't want to be in this grind I want to go and set up my own business somewhere doing what I love um and so maybe you can give people a little bit of um assistance a bit of help in achieving that and thinking that they can do it and maybe some of the most simple steps towards I don't know, setting up a a name, setting up a business, setting up a bank account. Where would you start? Oh, 100%. So um, as a follow-up, and we'll we'll pop them in the show notes, I've got access to two really fantastic resources that, depending on where you're at in your journey, will really, really help you. So the first is Accounting 101, which is, if we were taught this at school, sit down, I've got you for 50 minutes. This is the lesson that we should have been taught at school. And so that is company structure and how to decide between being a sole trader and a limited company. When, when, how, what, where, when you should have a separate bank account or a company bank account, how we track expenses, what accounting software is and how it works and when you should slash need to get an accountant. Spoiler alert, answer to that question is when you bloody want one, not when you think you need one. So accounting 101, we'll give you guys free access to that and there'll be a link to access that uh, on demand in the show notes. And then the second resource is if you are already self-employed, 
um, I can give you access to a 50 minute recording, which is me holding your hand and body doubling you through a financial well-being routine. So if I, as your accountant, was running your business for an hour every month, this is the routine that I would walk and talk you through every single month. So what order should we be doing things in? What are the weekly tasks? What are the monthly tasks? What are the quarterly tasks? Are we going through and doing big jobs that sometimes feel overwhelming, like going through your direct debits and seeing, is there any we could get rid of or cancel? All of the way through to logging into HMRC, to your government (laughs) gateway. And even that, right, like that immediately puts a barrier in place for people who have ADHD, because actually that's like a four step process to even log in. There's a text code that involves picking up your phone, that involves not getting distracted, getting the code, entering the code, successfully entering the code, remembering what you're doing, remembering why you logged in in the first place, and then actually checking your taxes. Whereas if you're watching me do it on demand, you'll be like, hang on, I've got to follow, Rachel's waiting for me. And so we walk and talk you through a financial well-being routine that is not only ticking all of the boxes that if your accountant was hopping into your numbers every month, this is what I would be doing. But fundamentally, I'm working with you to change the way that you feel about your finances and improve that sort of financial hygiene, financial well-being piece that will, if you have no need to, but are logging into your government gateway every single month and you can see taxes zero, outstanding zero, that is just a, a constant monthly reminder of green flag, I'm up to date, there's nothing to do. Even me saying to you, let's log in together every mm. single month. What does that look like? What does that feel like? Does it feel better when you do it every single month as opposed to only doing it on the 30th of January? And so let's explore all of those together. So depending on where you're at in your journey, if you are about to be or you're just becoming uh, self-employed or you're thinking about it and want to know, we can do Accounting 101. But if you're already a business owner and even me saying the words Government Gateway gave you the heebie-jeebies, you can actually walk and talk yourself through the financial wellbeing routine for business owners. So on the podcast, you have probably heard me talking about our nervous system quite a lot. And I work with our nervous system in all my one-to-one sessions, but also all my group coaching as well. So I'm really happy to let you know that I have a four-part workshop series called Regulating Your ADHD Nervous System. And it's all through the polyvagal lens. I recorded this a few months ago and it was a really successful coaching group. So I wanted to be able to make this available to you all as a four session series. You will get these once a week for four weeks. So it doesn't feel overwhelming and you're able to really sort of let the information integrate. So if you often feel out of control, you're easily triggered by daily stress, or perhaps you've noticed that your nervous system is always in this sort of constant state of fight or flight, this sympathetic mode, or perhaps you're just wondering how your ADHD impacts your nervous system and your daily life and would like to experience more inner calm, this is probably for you. So you'll have more clarity on what the those triggers are of the feelings of anxiety and worry and the hypervigilance that impacts your mental and physical health. And you'll also gain effective daily practices designed to help you understand and regulate your own nervous system with informed and science-backed information. If this sounds like what you're looking for, head to my website. It's all there on the homepage and really just have a read through and see if it's something that you need. So it's one month of dedicating to really understanding your own nervous system and what it is that you need more of to help you feel more regulated, calm, connected, and empowered. Head to my website, adhdwomenswellbeing.co.uk. Let's get back to the episode. What we're seeing is a shift. We're seeing a shift in a new generation of really making these things accessible. And they're just really small things, like you say. It's the small things of the hand-holding, the walking and the talking, the understanding those little trigger points are really going to stop us from doing the things. And the fact that you understand the the, the ADHD brain of where we're going to fall, the text, the this, the getting distracted, because if we can't do what you're talking about, we can have all the VAs and the, the help that we need. But if we can't do our own accounts, we can't feel empowered. There's something there within us that blocks us from our success. It's almost, you know, I don't know if you know that the term is like upper limiting, where we just stop ourselves and we go, no, we can't do that. I can't 
earn a million pounds. I can't hire X amount of employees because I still don't understand how to um, do my accounts or I still can't understand my taxes. So we cap ourselves from success and I've seen it so many times. And so when we break that down, it's like, ah, okay. And then you do see these breakthroughs. I've seen it myself. And you kind of think, can't believe that I've been upper limiting myself like that all these years when it was just a couple of questions that I needed to ask. And I'm wondering, you know, you said that you trained in a sort of more traditional accountancy. Uh, Do you mind asking how old you are? Yeah, I'm 30. Yeah, I was going to say, you look incredibly young. So (laughs) for somebody who is 30 and doing what they're doing, what did you see at the beginning of your career that you thought this is something needs to change? Yeah, so for me, a lot of it was around... um, I want to say the obvious stuff that people seem to miss as employers. So for me, we have a completely hybrid workforce. Uh, I literally this morning was having a conversation with a member of staff around, could she use flexible working? Could she leverage our flexible working policy to make sure that her work life is scheduled around her menstrual cycle because she really struggles at certain points in the month? And so for me, there was a lot of obvious stuff that was just around productivity uh, well-being, mental health, understanding that most people are productive at different times of day. Most people are not productive when they're chained to a desk from nine to five, but actually if they can work in an environment that works for them. Again, for me, as someone that's profoundly deaf, I struggle with something called hearing fatigue, which is being in an office is very overwhelming for me. I'll constantly be thinking that I miss hearing something. Whereas if I'm at home, I have lights that flash when certain noises happen and they're noises that I want to hear about. I've got a dog who will literally react if there is a noise that I want to hear about. And so I struggle much less at home. And so working environment, working space, working hours, flexible working policies, um, actually being taught how to identify when you're most productive. What does that look like? What does that feel like? Not only are you putting those policies in place, but are you encouraging other people through you demonstrating it yourself to use those policies to their full advantage. And so Mm. I came from a very traditional, stereotypical brown carpet. I call it a stale pale male sort of accountancy practice, which felt a bit stiff and had things like in transparent pay matrix. So I didn't go to university. I was an apprenticeship baby. And there were colleagues of mine who had degrees in geography who earned 5,000 pounds more than me because they had a degree Mm. in geography. And so I had soft skills that I'd learned through an apprenticeship. I w- had been working for three years longer than the people that hadn't gone to university. And so I feel as an employer, and we're an award-winning employer, we've scaled super rapidly. I have an employee waiting list of over 170 people waiting to join my firm because of the benefits package that we offer. We go on a workcation, all expenses paid, all inclusive holiday to Mallorca every year. But we also do things like we have private medical, private dental. We make sure the private medical covers any neurodivergence, like all of the things that you would expect a really great employer to do. And so if ever I talk about this stuff, I almost feel like I'm just stating the obvious, but I feel like lots of employers don't do the obvious stuff that would really help people. Um, And they seem to focus on things like pool tables. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I would, if I was you, keep your mouth shut because... (laughs) The, what you're saying here is just absolute gold and wisdom and you're doing something so different and shape-shifting Like you are literally taking a stale kind of industry and recognizing all those points and, you know, being 30 yourself and recognizing how many people who are your age, who are doing maybe similar things where they're going through apprenticeships now, entrepreneurialism is, is celebrated you are able to recognize that they don't want to go with a company, an accountancy like that, where they're going to made to be feel small or less than or not worthy um, because they're doing business in a different way or they have recognized their neurodivergence and they just don't get it. So yeah. it, it's, it's brilliant. Can I tell you a story? Yes. So last year I had a TikTok go very viral which resulted in some TV appearances, lots of press, lots of articles. And it was scary because the TikTok was about an OnlyFans creator who is a client of ours. 
And so just for context, we do not specialize in the type of client that we take on. We're not in a niche. Our speciality is our core values. So every single client that decides to work with us accept our core values. We recruit on the same core values and it's just a really wholesome, lovely place to work and to be a client. And so we, our goal is to be the accountancy practice of choice for small business owners, influencers, and celebrities. Within the influencer and the online creation space, we have some clients who are OnlyFans creators. And I went onto a podcast and was talking about an OnlyFans creator who expensed a boob job. And a soundbite went very viral. I'm talking like 20 million views viral. Luckily, it wasn't on my page. It was on the podcast page. Um, But it went wild. And it's scary. As a practice owner who has integrity as one of my, you know, top missions, as well as being a great person who wants to lower the barriers to financial education, I didn't want to be known as the boob job lady forever. And it felt scary because I've worked super hard to build the practice up to where it is now. And from a compliance perspective, it felt overwhelming. But through the storytelling and through the conversation that I was able to have on that podcast, on the TV appearances, and in all of the press afterwards, we had the most overwhelming response. Not because there was a queue of people that wanted to expense boob jobs, but because we listened to her. Mm. So she came to us and said, can I expense a boob job? And we were like, I'm pretty sure you can't expense a boob job. And she said, actually, I've read the small print and I think I might be eligible to to do this. Will you help me? And so we worked with her to put, put together a case. We spoke to HMRC. We got insured compliant tax advice and we were able to do that. And I went from being terrified that I'd be known as the boob job lady forever to actually being known as an accountant who really listens to clients Mm. and that was the most overwhelming response from people we even to this day get dms from people who've listened to that episode and say i don't feel like my accountant hears me when i say that and the biggest thing i took from that was that you heard her yeah or it's, it's the lack of judgment isn't it and it's finding a way for someone who you know wants to make a living in a certain way and facilitating that so they can you know legally do it and there's no judgment there yeah. and fantastic that there's now freedom and expression and we can facilitate and help people um i guess do what they want to do that feels right and authentic to them and you know the the what I hear a lot of, you know, when I'm coaching and I hear a lot of people come to me and they say, I'm doing this and they're doing typically a very sort of staid traditional job. And I'm going to say things like a lawyer, teacher, accountant, um, doctor, and they've got an idea because as people with ADHD, we have a lot of ideas, but then something comes and shuts that idea down and says, but I just can't do it. And so I wonder, do you have people that come to you and say, I have this idea for a business and I really want to make it work, but I just don't know how. Are you then there to sort of handhold them towards conceiving the idea? Yes, absolutely. So my life is split into two sections. I have Accountant She, which is my online platform. That's the lead singer in the band where I create long and short form, completely accessible consumable information for small business owners. And then if people engage with that content and they want to be a client, they move over to the blue side of my life, which is Strivex. And so Strivex is my accountancy practice and we also have a consulting team. So I head up the consulting team where I work with businesses who are about to go on or have just come off shows like Dragon's Den. We work with Stephen Barlett's team to do valuations for him. And I work with business owners either from an idea stage, from people who maybe need to pivot their business, either because they've just had an ADHD diagnosis and they want to just make things feel better, all of the way through to female self-employed people who are about to go on maternity leave, want to increase passive income streams within their business and really want some support in doing that too. So after I qualified as an accountant, I did an MBA, which is a master's in business. And so I'm able to take lots of high level concepts and translate them into what that looks like for business owners, but also to do that with their well-being in mind. And so before we kick off and do any consulting work, I encourage people to do things like quality of life audits and a wheel of life exercise to understand if if you've booked me to do financial forecasting or a cash flow forecast, let's not just copy and paste this year because it actually could be that this year didn't feel too good. And you might come into this session thinking that you want to make more, but it could be that you leave it realizing that you want to make the same amount and work less and feel better. 
And so uh, it's my job to worry about the numbers and your job to be creative, do what you do best and lean into how your business feels because so many of us become self-employed to to make money, but mm. we're all terrified of talking about money. And so outsource that, get help with it, work with somebody who you trust and who feels good and you can spitball ideas with and communicate in a way that feels good to you. And so, yeah, the neurodivergent side of the consulting is very, very strong because actually these are, you know, it's a group of people who don't struggle with the ideas, but actually struggle with the implementation and the delivery. Mm. And that's where I love that stuff. Let me build a spreadsheet for you and you go away and be creative. (laughs) Win-win. Yes. Oh, this is, it's just amazing. You know, I've got um, kids who are all different ages. Um, I've got a son who is 18. He's just about to do his um, A-levels this year. He's doing economics and he just, he just gets it. He gets it. He's like my husband, like maths, numbers, they kind of enjoy it. They, it's just easy. And then I've got three daughters who have inherited my creativity, my love of writing, um, talking, all of that. And they sadly haven't quite inherited, you know, the, the, the digital mathematical side. Um, and, my daughter, who's 16, is doing her GCSEs this year, and I've seen her struggle with maths from, from a very early age. And thankfully, I've managed to find her a, a fantastic tutor who is helping her. And what the most important thing that the tutor's doing is instilling it with confidence. Now, sadly, here in the UK, the I've talked about this a lot in the, in the podcast, is that I just don't think the education system is, um, I think it's 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 failing in, and it's not helping and it's not um, instilling confidence in, in, especially with maths. And I, I wonder if with your, your very forward thinking brain, do you see, I wish my daughter could learn things like financial wellbeing and have financial education as part of her maths GCSE and not all these crazy algebra equa- equations and all these things that she's doing that she, I don't think unless she goes on to do maths A level or maths, you know, anything anywhere else, she will have any, you know, and she hasn't got any interest. What she does have an interest in is applying practicalities and she's quite good at thinking up ideas. And I think that if she was, um, if she had those foundations of financial well-being of, this is when you're going to need an Excel spreadsheet. When you set up your own business, you're going to need to understand X, Y, and Z. When you're going to buy your first house, your mortgage is going to look like this and you're going to have to calculate, da, da, da. Why are we not seeing this in the education system now? And I guess, what would you do at being at the age of 30, if you could, what would you change in maths education? Um, maybe in this country? Yeah, of course. So for me, it's two things. It's maths education and then it's also careers advice. So Mm. I was actually told by a careers advisor that being an accountant was boring and that I had too much personality to be an accountant. And so I do a lot of lobbying with government. And so I am on the board. So I'm a director and trustee of AAT, which is my governing body for accountants in the UK. And so we do a lot of work with British government to try and get better financial education in schools, um, at the moment, the only sort of extra financial education that, de- that gets delivered in schools is the schools that have budget. Very often that is the private schools and not the publicly funded schools and the state schools. So it's very frustrating. Um, but it is changing. Our generation of children, your children, will be consuming a lot of this content, whether it's careers advice or education, on platforms like TikTok. And so that's where they get to find me. And I get in their algorithm and they get to learn that with me. And so for us, bespoking the platform to platform content has been really, really key in actually understanding how we can get better careers advice and get better financial education in schools. And for us, that is TikTok because of the demographic of ages that we're pitching to on TikTok is sort of corporate hilarious content, but also come to a client with me. What does a day in my life look like? And so we're trying to access them on communities where they are. And so at the moment, a good chunk of our talent in our workforce are actually part of a school leavers program. And so they're people who have found my content on YouTube, TikTok, or Instagram while they were at school searching for careers advice. They've done my on-demand work experience program because it's very hard to get work experience in the finance industry. And so I built a program that's a week long course that's accredited. Your school will let you do it as long as you're under supervision at home. And so you can access a week-long work experience program to work out what it's like to be an accountant. And then you can join us as part of our Future Leaders program at work. 
And so, oh again, incredible. it's not groundbreaking. It just comes from my experience of being an incredibly passionate young person who was very good at maths, who always felt alone because I was a young female with a personality who loved maths and just trying to turn accounting into the like legally blonde Barbie movie era that it deserves to be, which is my brand. And it is just showing people that you don't have to park your personality to work in professional services. You can do what I'm doing in the only career I wanted up until the age of 12 was Baby Spice. And I've somehow created a life for myself where I've just become the Baby Spice of the accounting industry. And I'm doing great things whilst doing that. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know if you know Jodie Hill and she runs her own law firm and she's basically done something very similar to you. Um, she's incredible and she's been on the podcast and you remind me in your mindset and, and everything reminds me so much of her where she's just turned um, law into what you've done with accountancy. And um, she's got ADHD, but she's just basically looked at the legal industry and decided that she doesn't want to do things that way. And she's just you know, pivoted and done things her way. And by being authentic and truthful, and it's the same with you, that's when you magnetize your tribe, your community. And it's when we make that decision to, to think, I'm not going to do it the way other people are doing it. And it feels wrong. And just because we've, we've been conditioned and told that's how things should be, doesn't mean that I have to do that. And the fact that even, you know, you did the apprenticeship, you didn't go to university, um, you know, it's only a very new school of thought, really, isn't it? That apprenticeships are could be a better way of entering the workspace. And I wondered what made you make that decision between um, uni and apprenticeship, and it was where did it come from? Yeah, good question. And again, I feel like I feel like if you listened to this episode, you'd then be like, "Oh, that's why her business works that way." I was a young carer. I'm an identical twin, and my identical twin sister is disabled. And so I have been a young carer from the moment I was born, uh, so much so that I didn't ever really realize that I was a young carer. And so, yeah, for me, going to university and leaving an identical twin who has learning disabilities wasn't an option for me. And so because of my home life, because I was a carer, um, yeah, going to university wasn't an option. I had unconditional offers because my school made me apply to UCAS. Uh, they don't let you not apply to UCAS. And so I had unconditional offers and didn't couldn't didn't want to go and so for me the apprenticeship route was the obvious one and so yeah I took the apprenticeship route I was earning three pounds an hour for quite a long time uh, which is why I refused to pay the apprenticeship minimum wage now and we actually have a minimum benchmark salary which is ten thousand pounds above the normal entry route salary which is great and so yeah I feel like my journey into work life hasn't been straightforward and definitely has fueled a lot of the change that I'm driving to be the change that didn't exist when I needed it. Amazing. And have you got accountants like in the family? Is it, did you, you know, <laughs> is, is there a parent or anyone that you kind of- There is no to? accountants in my family. <laughs> uh, my mum was a full-time carer for my sister and my dad is a welder fabricator. And I was, I think 14 or 15 years old when our household income went over 20,000 pounds for the first time. And so even that, like sharing that story, sh sharing the story of what coming from a lower income household looks like if you want to get a career in professional services, because most people that get work experience or a decent job in their early 20s, it's because somebody knows somebody. And so for me, a lot of the content creation that I do is just lowering the barriers to entry for people who don't have those contacts or don't have that start in life. And so in 2023, I launched the first ever corporate bursary scheme, which is where I fully fund somebody who wants to become an accountant but can't afford to do it. And so last year we launched with one placement, but in 2024, we are launching seven fully funded placements for people who can't afford to become an accountant. Wow. I am yeah. so inspired by you. And I think that so many other people will. I genuinely can't wait to share this episode because you are mind-blowing and I just wish you all the success in the world and I don't have any doubt that you're gonna do even more incredible things if you've this is what you've done at the age of 30 and explaining how your 
what other people would perceive as limitations and especially being a young carer and, and and you've still done what you've done and you've not seen wealth in your family, but you have visualized it and you can see that path. And a lot of people say, well, my family are working classes. You know, I don't know anyone that's a millionaire and I don't know anyone that's done really well or been a business owner or an entrepreneur. So how am I meant to do this? And you are proof that it is possible. And what an amazing mindset you've got. I don't think what you do is just going to help people from their accounts. I think it changes lives. It gives people hope and vision and goals and drive. And um, it's just fantastic. So I can't wait to to share all your resources. You know, do you work, is it only digitally or do you work in person as well? And where are you based? Of course. Yes, we work in person. And um, for the, most people, most of the time, love engaging with us digitally. But we have two offices, one in Buckinghamshire and one in Manchester. So all of our clients can come and do co-working with us. We encourage a lot of co-working. So you can come and visit the office. It's a place that you can use that office to meet your clients. Or if you have big, important business meetings, you can use our offices as well. Fantastic. Okay, well, I'll put everything in the show notes. Thank you so, so much for being here, Rachel, and for sharing your incredible story, your inspiring um, vision. And I have a feeling that I'm going to be bringing, I've got some ideas already. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. I really hope you enjoyed this week's episode. If you did and it resonated with you, I would absolutely love it if you could share on your platforms or maybe leave a review and a rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please do check out my website, adhdwomenswellbeing.co.uk for lots of free resources and paid for workshops. I'm uploading new things all the time and I would absolutely love to see you there. Take care and see you for the next episode.